Hey, you here? Oh, yes, you are. Thanks for dropping in on your Paul Leslie Hour. This time around, your host, Paul E. Leslie, just loves welcoming Tim Summer. He's a writer and music and cultural journalist. Tim Summer is the author of the new book, Only Want to Be With You. No, not the inside story of Dusty Springfield. The inside story of Hootie and the Blowfish. Hey, let's keep the Paul Leslie Hour going. Visit www.thepaulleslie.com slash support. And we thank you from the bottom to the top of our hearts. Yes. And now I'll hand it over to your host, the last of the teenage idols, Paul E. Leslie. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to properly introduce the man that we are joined with today. Tim Sommer is an acclaimed published music journalist, a former A&R representative for Atlantic Records. He's an avant pop musician, MTV VH1 news VJ and producer. And he is also the author of this book, Only Want to Be With You, The Inside Story of Hootie and the Blowfish. And ladies and gentlemen, I was walking in Charleston and I went into the historical society and the guy at the store was saying, he saw me pick up this book and he said, oh man, you got to get this. You have got to get this. I have read a lot of books, biographies of musicians, band books. And I can honestly say this is the most exciting and most interesting of all of them. I have absolutely gotten a kick out of reading this. So, Tim, thank you so much for being with us today. That is such an extremely, extremely kind introduction. Uh, Thank you so very, very much. Um, You know, I wonder, to hear that you found it as interesting as you did and that other people do is just so rewarding because I've been told by a lot of different people that my ability to tell this story uh, from from having had from having worn so many hats in the music industry uh, may have assisted me in being able to tell a full a full bodied version of uh, really not just what Hootie and the Blowfish went through. It's a story of what any band goes through. A band forming that you know is just a bunch of kids who form in college and you never hear anything more of them after they play six gigs. This is their story a band that becomes huge and gets dropped before their first record comes out, gets becomes huge locally, gets a record deal and gets dropped before the first record comes out. This is their story. It's a story, I think, of anyone who came of age in the 1980s and put together a band with their best friends because they loved music. That's the reason Hootie and the Blowfish did it. They did it because they wanted to make music with their best friends because they were kids, not kids, they were young adults obsessed with music who wanted to make music with their best friends. That's all they wanted to do. And so very many people can identify with that, even if they never formed a band. And that's the story that I wanted to tell. I wanted to tell the story, not just of Hootie and the Blowfish, not just of Darius Rucker, Dean Felber, Jim Sonnefeld, and Mark Bryan. I wanted to tell the story of anyone coming of age in the early and mid 1980s, loving music, feeling a little bit outsider because they loved music, then finding their tribe through the music they loved. Well, I'm very glad that you wrote this book. And like I was kind of saying at the introduction, there were so many times where I felt like I was right there. I felt like I was going into a certain room and there was always this little element of suspense. Like, I mean, some of it, I knew what was going to happen, but it was still, I I was right there. So maybe you can tell the listeners and viewers out there, what emotionally were you thinking? What was going through your head? The very, very first time you saw this group of musicians performing live. That's That's a very good question. And I think I addressed that question at length in the book. And fortunately, when I tell that story, I'm telling the truth. So, you know, it's still a story that's 
it's still an account that's very real in my heart. Um, I was in this path club in Charleston called Mishkins. Mishkins or Mishkins? I'm not sure the pronunciation. Uh, there are about 800 people there. I was late for the show. Um, I had flown in from California, from Los Angeles to see the show, and I was late. Uh, I had no real expectations other than my boss at the time, Danny Goldberg, had said, uh, this is a band that's making a little bit of noise locally. Why don't you go check it out and see if there's anything going on there? And we didn't have any real expectations. We certainly didn't have any expectations that we were going to find one of the biggest bands of all time. That was certainly not in the cards. Um, I showed up. I showed up late. And in this beautifully steamy hot room, I knew within 30 seconds, and I'm not exaggerating, and they weren't even playing, when I walked in, they weren't even playing one of their own songs. And their own songs are so good. They weren't even playing one of their own songs. They were playing Bill Withers, Use Me. <laughs> and I knew within 30 seconds, and this is not an exaggeration, Paul, I knew within 30 seconds that I wanted to work with these people. I did not know that they were going to be huge. That wasn't anywhere in my head. The only thought in my head was, I want to work with these people. And one of the reasons I thought that, maybe the primary reason I thought that, is there was something about them, even when they were playing somebody else's song, that was instantly familiar. They felt like people I knew. They felt like people I was friends with. They felt like people I wanted to be friends with. In the book, one of the things I say, and, I, and strangely enough, this is true, is that I instantly recognized them as members of Generation R.E.M., meaning mm -hmm. there's an entire generation of us people who came of age in the 1980s who had their lives changed by the powerful, strange, charismatic, poppy music of R.E.M. And I instantly recognized that like me, Hootie and the Blowfish had had their lives changed by being an R.E.M. fan. I can't tell you in any real terms how I recognized that just from hearing them play one cover song, but I did. I knew right away I wanted to be friends with these people. And the guiding, the thing that guided me at that moment and guided me through all of the four and a half years, five years, that I worked with Hootie and the Blowfish was that they were my friends and I wanted to make good things happen to them and with them because they were my friends. And honestly, and I, again, this sounds a little strange, but I'm telling you the truth, whatever success they achieved, whatever success we achieved together was secondary to me wanting nice things to happen to them because because I won, because they were my friends. Hmm. Long, it was a bit of a long answer to that question. I, I apologize. No, I no. mean, the, the short answer to that question is I instantly recognized them. I recognized them as members of Generation REM and people that I wanted to be a part of their lives. Hmm. As a result of writing this book, was there any revelation or anything that hadn't occurred to you before? That's a very interesting question. And the answer is yes, definitely. Um, and I don't want to get too inside baseball here, but you know, this is addressed at great length in the book. There's a moment in 1996, late 1995, when the band are beginning to record their second album, the album that would eventually be released in April of 1996 as Fairweather Johnson. So towards the end of 1995, beginning of 1996, the band want to record are saying to us, their management is saying to us, hey, we wanna go in and make a second record. Meanwhile, the record label is saying, no, 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 no. We are not nearly done with Cracked Review. Cracked Review is still in the top three. It's bouncing back and forth between one and two and three. In Christmas 1995, Cracked Review is selling 250,000 copies a week, which is insane numbers. And the, 
the then president of Atlantic Records at this point, Danny Goldberg had been replaced by a fellow, a very nice fellow named Val Azoli. And Val called me into his office and he said, Tim, we need you to do whatever you can to stop Hootie from releasing their second record too soon. Because right now we've sold about eight or 10 million copies of Cracked Review. We've released four singles. We want to, Tim, we want to release a fifth single, a sixth single, a seventh single, an eighth single. We can make this as big as Thriller. We can make this album one of the biggest selling albums at the time of release in history. The kind of numbers that you associate with Thriller and Bad Out of Hell and Purple Rain and, uh, and the Eagles' greatest hits, these albums that at the time of their release sold 20 or 25 million records. So I said, Val, that sounds wonderful. I don't think the band are gonna go for it. The band keep on telling me, their management keeps on telling me, hey, we gotta release a second record. We gotta release a second record. We've been playing these songs for 10 years. Uh, we're tired, we wanna we want release new material. Now, you asked me what surprised me. What did I find out writing this book that surprised me? I then went up to San Francisco, the San Francisco area where the band were recording their second album. And I sat down with them and I said, hey, um, the label wants you to delay the release of Fairweather Johnson, and they want to keep on releasing, they want to keep on working, 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 cracked review. And the band told me, no, we want to make our second record. Okay, here's the bit that surprised me. I thought the band were talking in a unified voice. They weren't. It was really the manager and Mark Bryan, the guitar player, who really, really wanted to make that second record. Darius Rucker and Dean Felber, and to a good degree, Jim Sonnefeld, weren't, weren't as sure. Both of them would have been happy to take a break and let Atlantic keep on releasing uh, and keep on releasing singles off the Cracked Review. And now looking back 25 years later, everyone involved thinks that was a mistake. So the revelation to me was that after 25 years, everyone thinks it was a mistake and we should have listened to Atlantic Records. And to be frank, I should have pushed the band harder. The band listened to me. And what I wanted to do was respect their wishes. I thought their wishes were they wanted to release their second record. It turns out I should have pushed them a little harder and they probably could have gone along with the idea of delaying the second record. That's one of the things I learned. Another one of the things I learned, um, Really all the things I learned in the book and learned in detail. Well, I'll tell you something actually. I loved being able to tell the story of Brantley Smith. Brantley Smith was the band's mm -hmm. first drummer. He was in Hooting the Blowfish from uh, the autumn of 1985 to the middle of 1989. Uh, and the band loved him. He was, a, everyone says he was a phenomenal drummer, a phenomenal lead vocalist and backing vocalist. And in mid-1989, he left the band because he thought it was incompatible with his faith, with the mission that he was on uh, as a Christian. It was fascinating to dig into his story and tell his story and to realize and to learn from the people who had seen the band, the band between 1985 and 1989 and to talk to Darius, Dean, Mark, and even Sony uh, how valued a member he was of that band. I'm glad I was able to tell that story. And that was a, an interesting part of the book. You know, it almost seems like stating the obvious maybe, but, and I'm sure people have told you this a thousand times, you can look through almost anybody's CD collection that was born in the 70s or 80s, and inevitably you will find that copy of Cracked Review. <laughs> you know, when I was doing preparation, I went through the, the whole discography and I was listening to it, listening to it, and everything just, it actually sounded even better than I remembered. Uh, I think I had that experience too. When I was going it, back, when I was going back and listening to the, uh, when I was going back and listening to the music, I was really pleased. Uh, one of the things that I said in the book was that if you start listening to Cracked Review, the first album with the second side, meaning the, 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 the songs five through nine, 
you hear a completely different, really intense, almost moody record, mm -hmm. almost a concept album about race and, and mourning. Uh, something very different from what you get on the first side. Um, and I was able to once again fall in love with the third album, Musical Chairs, which I loved. And also discovering that there's an album they made in 2003 with producer Don Was, which I had never really spent that much time with because it's one of the albums that I did not work on. Um, and then finding that that was really one of their best records. But it is interesting. I mentioned to you before when you said that everyone has that record in their collection. I mentioned that at Christmas time, 1995, the album was selling these incredible numbers. As I said, 250, 300,000 a week. And I remember I asked a friend of mine, my friend Tom, I asked him, why is this happening? Why all of a sudden, or Hootie and the Blowfish wasn't all of a sudden, but why have their numbers gone from 125, 150, 100 a week to 250, 275 a week? And he said, Tim, it's easy. It's Christmas time and you don't know what to buy your niece or nephew. So you say, uh, I'll get him a Hootie and the Blowfish record. So in Christmas time, 1995, I think there were a lot of kids out there who were getting two or three copies of, of Cracked Review <laughs> from their aunts and grandmothers and uncles and other people who didn't know what to get them. Uh, there is a beautiful, and I do mean beautiful, ubiquity to Hootie and the Blowfish's Cracked Review, to the fact, as you said, that it is so much a part of American experience for people who were, say, between the ages of 18 and 30 in 1994, 95, 96. It's, I always say that one of the really wonderful and main functions of music, Paul, is as, a, is as a mnemonic, if I'm pronouncing that word correctly, mnemonic, meaning it's something that reminds us of a place and time. We never, never, Paul, just hear a song. When we hear a song, we visualize all the places we have been when we heard that song. Mm. We visualize the road we were going down the first time we heard that song. We visualize a, a woman or a man that we kissed while listening to that song. We visualize even, oh, remember I was at that gym, the gym and that song came on the loudspeakers. No song stands in isolation. Every song has this function as a signpost of a memory. And it is so amazing that Hootie and the Blowfish made this record, Cracked Review, that is a signpost of memory, a mnemonic for so many people. And I'm so very proud to be a part of that. And I, ho I hope, I hope I honored that function in the book. And I write about that in the book. I write about the fact that really, that's one of the main functions of music. And isn't it marvelous that Hootie and the Blowfish had that function? I wanted to honor that function. I wanted to make a book that was about what Hootie and the Blowfish meant to people, not just their story. Mm. Well, uh, what, what part of the country are you in at the moment, Tim? I'm in Connecticut. In Connecticut, so I'm okay. in the Northeast, Northeast New York City suburbs. Okay. Well, I'm here in South Carolina, uh, Pootie and the Blowfish, Ground Zero, yes. uh, so to speak. And uh, on that note, because th this city is full of fans of the band, have you noticed any kind of commonality or characteristics that you notice with Hootie and the Blowfish fans? That's interesting. Um, possibly... One of my very first impressions of the band was that they existed in this place that was sort of a, a nexus between Bruce Springsteen, John Mellencamp, and R.E.M. with a little Bob Seger mixed in there. Um, is there, there may be amongst their fans a commonality of affection for those sort of artists. Uh, no, that's an interesting question. I've never thought, I've never ever thought about that. 
And I think the answer is no, not necessarily. Uh, I do think that once Hootie became so gigantic, once Cracked Review went up to the stratosphere, it a lot of people, a lot of more underground or indie type listeners who would have liked that record didn't give it the time of day because of how popular it was. When in fact, you know, there were a lot of people. I think Hootie are one of the foundational bands for Americana music, but they won't get that credit because they're so huge. I think they were ahead of the ahead of their time in terms of the groundwork they laid for the Americana movement and the groundwork they laid for the modern country music. So many times I hear contemporary country music and I think, okay, that sounds like Hootie and the Blowfish to me. I mean, I think kind of Hootie and the Blowfish to a degree, people like Sheryl Crow, um, helped pave the way for what both Americana became and what contemporary country came, um, became. Um, but it's interesting, I've never once thought about a commonality. Uh, obviously, it's people who like music from the heart and it's people who like music that is melodic and people who don't care that much about things like um, using, you know, uh, guitar solos or progressive musicianship. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind I of... I mean, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> well, my gut kind of first reaction when I... Th- well, just if I think about the people that I'm pals with who are Hootie and the Blowfish fans, it's kind of like my most unpretentious friends. Mm. Which it, being unpretentious, I think, is the is like an ideal everyone should strive for. I think so. that's that's an extremely good way to put it. And there's not a member of Hootie and the Blowfish who is a pretentious bone in their body. Hmm. Even though some of the music they like, uh, for instance, Darius, especially he, before Hootie became big, had very sort of left of the dial alternative musical tastes. And Lord knows there's a lot of music I found out about, a lot of really left of the dial college radio type music that I found about through them. A lot of alternative and sort of space age bluegrass, like Bela Fleck, for instance, that I found out about through them. Um, But you're right. I think that unpretentiousness is both a uh, defining quality of them and their fans. Interestingly enough, it's not. Very rarely have I ever been accused of being unpretentious, which is why I think it's funny that so many people, people have occasionally found it very interesting that I've ended up so associated with Hootie and the Blowfish since I have sort of both very, uh, I have avant-garde tastes and I've been involved in a lot of avant-garde things. but I fell in love with Hootie and the Blowfish because, you know, I loved what they were doing. I loved their, I loved their jangle pop. I loved that they mm. were coming from this place of like REM, DBs, to name a band from North Carolina, Feelies, uh, college rock, 1980s college rock. And they were just people I wanted to hang out with, even though I didn't play golf, even though I wasn't that... Uh, aware of college athletics, because being from the Northeast, originally, you don't really follow college athletics the way people do in South Carolina. Hmm. Well, on that note, something that I really enjoyed from reading the book is when you got into a lot of like the influences, especially like, hey, this is something you maybe didn't pick up on uh, just in terms of bands or artists that influenced Hootie and the Blowfish, or people that they covered. And I had a really good time going and listening to those things. And sometimes I would think, you know, I can hear that in them. I can hear how that was an influence. Like, it was very interesting to me. Like, the, when you went into Carolina Beach music. Yeah. You know, I, I thought that was really cool. It was, you know, of course, I'm going to say this again, being from the Northeast, Carolina beach music is something that really only people from the Carolinas are exceptionally familiar with. And in fact, there's somebody, and maybe it's somebody you should have on the show one day, there's a writer from North Carolina named David Manconi, 
who's written a beautiful book about the history of North Carolina music that has a lot about beach music. And it was one of my prime sources of education on the whole movement. Uh, but once it was brought to my attention, I was like, wow, I can totally hear that in what they do and what Hootie and the Blowfish do. I can totally hear it. Um, and again, it's interesting. I, I, I hate to continue, I, mean, I don't hate to mention it, but you know, I continually mention REM as a reference point, but that's definitely one of their most significant reference points, uh, as was sort of the whole uh, North Carolina jangle pop movement, which is Let's Active, Don Dixon, the DBs. Um, that was uh, that whole movement was enormously influential on them as well. I think I should mention something. I, I'll go on the record for saying this. When I think about bands who have done an album of covers, mm -hmm. I cannot think of any band that made a covers record better than Scattered, Smothered, and Covered. It's interesting, isn't it? It's great. I mean, it's it's like it's one of those CDs. I just I can't get tired of it. Some of the the covers that Hootie and the Blowfish did, I think, like this is better than the original. I think that's the case with the. Uh, I'm not meaning to di to dismiss to diss Led, Ze Led Zeppelin, but I think that their version of uh, of uh, the Led Zeppelin song they do, "Hey Hey, What Can I Do" or whatever it's called, um, is better than Led Zeppelin's because they added, you know, Led Zeppelin's version has, you know, bluegrass as a reference point that it doesn't really explore. Who do you actually found that reference point? And then they they brought it out to the forefront of the song. But I agree with you. And likewise, I think the recordings they did of Foster and Lloyd songs uh, were are phenomenal, and helping expose them to the world. Uh, you know, this is a band that, at any given day, I think even in 2022, this is true. That if you said to them, "You're just going out tonight and you're just playing covers," they'd be perfectly happy. <laughs> Is there a Hootie and the Blowfish song that means the most to you personally? Interesting question. Uh, curiously, I'm I, as I detail in the book, I actually play organ on I Go Blind, and I'm extremely proud of that. But if there's one that really feels to me, oh wow, I was I loved that and I was part of that. It was um, the first track on Musical Chairs, I Will Wait. That was a track, when they were working that out in the studio, they were having a little bit of trouble. They were having some difficulty finding an opening riff and finding some harmonies in the chorus to hook onto it. And I was able to chime, I, I, I was in the studio with them and I was able to chime in and I remember suggesting an angle on the opening riff. I remember saying, I actually remember this conversation. I said to Mark Bryan, he was trying to work out an opening riff for that song. And I said to him, you can never go wrong if you hear, don't fear the reaper in your head and try to apply it to whatever you're doing. <laughs> and since then, that's advice I've consistently given the bands. If they're stuck on a riff, I say, here, don't fear the reaper in your head and then apply it to whatever you're doing. Um, I love that song. Um, trying to think what else. I mean, I, there, there are also, there are many that mean a great deal to me, but I will say, I will wait, I go blind. Um, not even the trees off a of cracked review, I think is an exquisitely beautiful song. And it's also, and I think I tell the story in the book, when we record in cracked review and as I, I will say again and again, and as I say again and again in the book, um, no one had any expectations for Cracked Review. In fact, as I, as I detail, we had to fight for its release. The label didn't want to release it. Um, but it was a beautiful recording session. It was a, the quickest, most efficient, most easygoing, less, most tension-free recording session I have ever been involved with. Uh, I've been involved with recording three song demos with folk singers that gave me more trouble than the entire Crack Review album. 
I remember I was sitting on the floor with my back against the wall and I heard them, I heard Dean playing the bass riff to Not Even the Trees. And it was the, I felt something electric. I felt something that's absolutely true, Paul. I felt something a little like shake in my body. It was like, there's some kind of magic going on right now. Something might happen with this record. And so not even the trees has that symbolism for me, but I also think it's a, it's a perfect example of how there's this depth to the Cracked Review album that it generally doesn't get credit for. Hmm. I know that you're a fan of Bob Dylan. Yes, sir. As I am. What do you think of the, uh, the hugeness of Darius Rucker and his recording of Wagon Wheel? which Bob Dylan co-wrote. Uh, I think it's a, it's a beautiful full circle moment because as you know, uh, I won't say there was tension because that's the wrong word. There was a legal issue mm -hmm. with Bob Dylan at the time of the recording of the first, of crack, at the time of the release of Crack Review because of the use of uh, some lyrics from, uh, uh, now I can't remember if it was Idiot Wind or Tangled Up in Blue, whatever it was use of some Bob Dylan lyrics on Only Want to Be With You. So, and it was resolved before the before it got to be a big problem. And I think it's beautifully full circle that Only Want to Be With You, which features some lyrics by Bob Dylan, was the first gigantic hootie hit. And that Wagon Wheel is really one of the, which is, you know, with, which is co-written by Bob Dylan is, one of Darius's signature songs. I think that's fantastic. Um, I am a huge Bob Dylan fan and uh, he's not in many ways a Hootie-esque artist, which is why it's sort of fascinating to find these two really high profile places where he intersects with the band. It's very interesting. And that's exactly, I didn't have the words for full circle, but that's how it, it hits me as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it absolutely does. I mean, uh, you know, Only Want to Be With You wasn't just a Hootie song. It was their first gigantic hit. It was their first big hit. And so here we are. Uh, how many years later was that? There was uh, 20, 23 years later. I'm not sure the exact amount. No, I can't. I don't remember what the exact amount was. 20 that Darius had wagon wheel and uh, uh, yeah, it's this beautiful full circle moment. Uh, I will say that if, you know, that whole period, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite Bob Dylan records is is actually his, his latest record, uh, Rough and Rowdy Ways. Yeah. And uh, Self Portrait, which is an album not a lot of people are that big on. That's, one of my favorite Dylan records. And to me, that's a record that's very Hootie-ish in its sense of family. Hootie, at their best, when they're recording, they sound like a family. They sound like a family. They sort of, the studio bought into the back porch or the back porch bought into the studio. That's what Cracked Review sounds like to me. That's what Musical Chair sounds like to me. That's what Fairweather Johnson sounds like to me, even with all its flaws. And Bob Dylan, that's an effect he achieves a lot too. So that's a commonality between them too. Well, anybody out there, if you want more information on our guest, it's timsommerwriting.com. And again, the inside story of Hootie and the Blowfish, Only Want to Be With You from University of South Carolina Press. In closing, or is there anything you want to say to the people out there? Anything at all? I want to say this, uh, every, I bet everyone out there has a friend or a relative who's been in a band. If you haven't been in a band yourself, maybe it's a band you're only in for two weeks. Maybe it's a band you were in for two years. Maybe it's a band that never played except at your cousin's wedding. Maybe it's a band that played clubs for years before you realizing that you had to go off in a different direction with your life. Or maybe it's even a band 
that had some success and got a record deal, who knows? But I bet almost everyone listening has been in a band or is a close friend who's been in a band or a close relative. Every story of every band is interesting. And that's the absolute truth. The story of the Beatles, so detailed that you've read so much about. The story of the band that you've never heard of has just as many fascinating details. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to tell this story because it's the story of a band. And the story, it's a story of a band that so many people who picked up guitars in their dorm rooms or picked up guitars in 11th grade or who got out of work when they were in their 20s and when they left work in the evening, they went downtown to a friend's house and played a few songs. Your story was interesting, even if you were in a band that no one never heard of. And I wanted people to see that the story of how and why you pick up a guitar and sit down with your best friend and write a song or play someone else's song, how that's a beautiful, beautiful story. In Hootie and the Blowfish's case, it became Hootie and the Blowfish. But even when it doesn't become Hootie and the Blowfish, it's still a beautiful story. And it's people doing things because they love music and they want to use music as a way to reach their friends and spend time with their friends. And that's very much the story that I want to tell and only want to be with you. Well, Tim, thank you so much for writing this book. It's brought a lot of joy to me. Uh, and thank you also for coming on here and talking about it. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Paul. And it's, it's been a pleasure. Yes, sir. All right. Well, have a great one. Okay, you you know, the Paul Leslie yeah, Hour is yeah. made possible by people like you, listeners, viewers. Please go to thepaulleslie.com slash support, and you'll know what to do when you're there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who contributes. Performance of The Entertainer intro song by John Primerano. And, of course, this is your announcer speaking. See you next time on the Paul Leslie Hour.